Otto Benger begged Werner to take him back to America. Werner definitely did not want to do this. But uh, Otto Benger threatened to um, jump in the river and be eaten by crocodiles if Werner didn't take him back to America, which he thought was St. Louis. And Werner had to explain to him, no, there's a bigger city called New York. And that's where we're going. Werner and Otto Benger left for America within weeks. This time, they made the 3,000-mile journey via Liverpool, transporting crates of live animals, parrots, monkeys, and snakes. Werner had his hands full, but Otto Benger found no trouble passing the time. Otto Benger discovered cigarettes on the steamship, and he kept going to the uh, counter where cigarettes and whiskey were sold, and. Uh, imbibed at his pleasure and gave the bill to Werner. But Werner's hoard of African artifacts failed to sell in New York, and he had to head to the south to ask his relatives for money. But Otto Benga seemed to be settling into life in the city. He was amazed at the height of the buildings, he was amazed at all the things that we're amazed about about New York. At one point when he was taken to the Hippodrome to see a society circus, he saw the baby elephant handing out programs. And he thought that was wonderful that, that the elephant had found a place to be engaged in some useful activity. And uh, he started talking to the elephant. And the crowd was amazed that he could actually get the elephant to do things, which astounds me even to this day. Otta Benga imagined that he'd also be able to make a go of it in New York. Werner arranged accommodation for him in the American Museum of Natural History, where he thought Otta Benga would at least be safe. I think my grandfather saw Otta Benga living a life as a, as, as a, a performer, if you will. Uh, perhaps that's not the best life in the world, but at least it's, uh, it's better than being eaten alive uh, in Africa. But almost as soon as Werner left New York, other people began making plans for the pygmy. While living at the museum, Otta Benga came to the attention of William T. Hornaday, a conservationist who'd saved the American bison and was now the director of the Bronx Zoo. Hornaday offered to take Otta Benga off the museum's hands. He thought he was going to look after the zoo's elephants. But instead, he was going to be put back on public display. The exhibition was that of a human being in a monkey cage. New York Times, September 9th, 1906. A human being in a monkey cage. A human being happened to be a Bushman. One of a race that scientists do not rate high in the human scale. But to the average non-scientific person in the crowd of sightseers... There was something about the display that was unpleasant. It is probably a good thing that Benga doesn't think very deeply. If he did, it isn't likely that he was very proud of himself. When he woke in the morning and found himself under the same roof... With the orangutans and the monkeys. For that is where he really is. On September the 8th, 1906, Hornaday put Otta Benga on display in the monkey house with a chimpanzee for a playmate. The sign read, The Missing Link. The entire episode had been swept under the carpet, but Anne Hornaday recently discovered the story. It was her great-uncle William T. Hornaday who had arranged the exhibition. When I first heard about it, I was appalled. And I asked my father about it, and he did remember hearing about this episode, um, and remembered his mother being very upset about it. It was a public sensation. On a single day, 40,000 people turned up to see Otta Benga and the chimp. Bushman shares cage with Bronx Park apes. Some laugh over his antics, many are not pleased. So, you know, it's not as if this went un unremarked, and it didn't go uncriticized, and I think that's important to remember too. The exhibition lasted only two weeks. African-American church ministers insisted that Otta Benga be released, 
not because the exhibition was racist, but because they thought the pygmy should be converted to Christianity. Otabenga was now on offer to anyone who'd take him. Uh, an asylum in Brooklyn had called, um, an African-American group, charitable group, had called asking to bring him out there. Colored orphan home gets the pygmy. <clears throat> Otabenga has left the New York Zoological Park in the Bronx and has been installed in the Howard Colored Orphan Asylum, Bean Street and Troy Avenue, Brooklyn. There it is hoped that by association with the colored children and their instructors, the pygmy may, may be civilized so that when he goes back home, he will be able to teach his people. Although an adult, Otabenga was confined to an orphanage, hidden away from a public who had queued to see him. Exhibiting Otabenga at the zoo had been designed not as a mere sideshow, the display had been masterminded by a man called Madison Grant, a wealthy conservationist who had founded the Bronx Zoo. He was also one of America's greatest racists. He had decided to put Otterbenga on display to educate the masses about scientific racism. When Madison Grant died in 1937, it is said that his family burned all of his papers. His remaining legacy is a book. A rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak or unfit, in other words, social failures, would solve the whole question in 100 years. Race feeling may be called prejudice by those whose careers are cramped by it, but it is a natural antipathy which serves to maintain the purity of type. If the melting pot is allowed to boil without control and deliberately blind ourselves to all distinctions of race, creed, or color, the type of Native American of colonial descent will become as extinct as the Athenian in the age of Pericles and the Viking in the days of Rollo. So what is this book that you're reading? This book is The Passing of the Great Race by Madison Grant, a classic of American racist literature. The Passing of the Great Race was a bestseller when it was first published in 1916. It promoted the idea that the survival of the white master race, the Nordics as Grant called them, was threatened by the lower races, so they had to be kept apart. Although Grant was only an amateur anthropologist, he was highly influential. He was a player, he was an insider, he hobnobbed with the big scientists, and the big scientists agreed with him. This is someone who was a Yale graduate at Columbia Law School, um, and with the luxury of not having to work for a living because he was independently wealthy, um, he devoted himself full time to um, uh, early conservation, for which his work is generally admired, um, and early anthropology, to which, of course, for which, of course, is not admired. Grant, a eugenicist, argued that evolution should not be left to chance. He lobbied for laws banning interracial marriages and limiting immigration, laws passed by people softened up by human zoos and now susceptible to Grant's arguments. The cross between a white man and an Indian is an Indian. The cross between a white man and a Negro is a Negro. The cross between a white man and a Hindu is a Hindu. And the cross between any of the three European races and a Jew is a Jew. When I read my students Madison Grant and I read it angrily, um, my students say, why do you take such a personal interest in this? And I say, well, because it was my grandparents and great-grandparents that he was trying to keep out of the United States. It is a very personal story. To, for, for most Americans, in fact. Grant's argument found followers all over the world. In 1930, after the passing of the great race was translated into German, Grant was bestowed with what he regarded as one of his greatest honors. He received a fan letter from an aspiring politician in Germany, which said, your book is my Bible, signed Adolf Hitler. Um, Grant's 
correspondence has disappeared, that letter is not with us anymore, um, but there is eyewitness testimony that he brandished this letter uh, at, at people to show how great and how influential both he was and how seriously the Germans were taking his ideas, which is something he was proud of. He was a real <laughs> by the way. Put that on your television. <laughs> Three years after Hitler sent his letter to Madison Grant, he seized power in Germany and turned his hero's ideas into policy. Once the Nazis adopted it and embraced it wholeheartedly, that caused a lot of Americans, although not all Americans, um, to rethink it. Some American scientists were saying things like, hey, the Germans are beating us at our own game, and uh, this is a bad thing. Uh, we need to get more like them. So there, there is a dirty little history there that um, we do need to bring out into the open. The Nazis set about using scientific racism as the foundation of the Third Reich. They took the ideas that were promoted in human zoos further than anyone else, instituting a systematic elimination of inferior races in the defense of their own superior Aryan race. In the end, they slaughtered millions in the name of scientific racism, an idea for which Otto Benga has been used as a prime example. Guilty or not guilty? In 1947, at the Nuremberg War Trials, Nazi doctors named Grant and his book in their defense arguing that the Third Reich had merely been copying American ideas. Military Tribunal 1 has found and has judged you guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and sentences you to death by hanging, and may God have mercy upon your soul. In the wake of the Holocaust, mixing race and science became taboo. The ideas of Madison Grant and the early anthropologists were buried. Since the Nazi atrocities of World War II, talking about racial difference has become taboo. How does it make you feel talking about this stuff? Me? It's not something that particularly means much to me. We have been accustomed to race is evil and sex is dirty. Is there such a thing as race? I don't hate any races. I don't fear many races. And um, I think there's a difference between recognizing racial differences and fearing or hating them. I have to think a lot to kind of say what I think about it. Racism would exist whether or not um, races are real. There are large individual differences within a race, but um, I, I, I don't think I could play basketball as well as uh, a well-trained uh, African-American, uh, and I, I wonder if a well-trained African-American could uh, do uh, plasma physics as well as I do. Isn't that racist? Yes, it's racist. I didn't, I never said I wasn't a racist. There have been no human zoos since the 1940s. Today's anthropologists still study differences between humans, but reach very different conclusions. Of course, there are differences across continents. Right? If you go to Asia, it's clearly different from Africa, it's clearly different from Europe, and people vary in skin color, in hair type, in body size, in fatness and all sorts of things and this is related to the particular adaptations to the environment so you see that probably it's good to have dark skin if you are in a tropical country but this is not fixed so this doesn't make a race right in terms of what was implied in the past was that the, the different races had different cognitive capacities as well. And this is not true. People are very flexible, very intelligent and very able to adapt. So does race exist? Or? I don't think so. No, I don't. I wouldn't call race. I would call just diversity. We are not really allowed to talk about these differences. 
nowadays, I think. But talking about them is actually good to understand better what's, what are humans as, as a species, how we are similar and how we are different as well. And this doesn't mean worse or better.